Sean Hamer back with another Mission Impossible episode review. This time I've moved on to Season 7, Episode 12, which is called Crack Up. So we start this one at a chess club where champion Peter Cordell exits into the waiting car of his brother Harry and is handed a gun. Later that night, Cordell gets into the apartment of a recently widowed woman named Taylor, who has inherited stock options that Cordell's employer wants. Cordell hits the poor woman and then throws her off the balcony as an apparent suicide. Jim uses spy speak to get his instructions from a motorcyclist. The mission... Get evidence to put Cordell away and learn who his employer is. The apartment scene shows us the usual planning, including some interesting drugs. You'll see how that shakes out. And guest agents Sandy, as well as Dr. Adler. Jim goes into the chess club with credentials as a visiting chess master, spraying some drops of a hypnotic drug on the pieces that Cordell will use, with Barney watching the game through a camera and using a computer to relay moves to Jim, who's wearing special glasses. As the game goes on, Cordell seems to get a bit agitated and distracted, and his vision gets blurry. Jim wins the game, and outside the club, he asks Cordell for a lighter through which he is somehow able to initiate Cordell's hypnotic trance and give him instructions to follow, which will be triggered by the words, take a pawn, and to come out of it when he hears his name. Dr. Adler wakes Cordell up, starts a bit of an argument about the game just played, and uses the magic words, taking a pill to simulate death and putting his cane in Cordell's hand with fake blood. Cordell comes to life again, taking his prints off the cane and speeding away. Meanwhile, Willie waits at a tavern where a fellow named Leslie Harper is supposed to arrive with a new deal for Cordell, but he didn't make his flight and he's late. Sandy comes by as well, and Harper finally appears, with Willie intercepting him, saying he's Cordell's man. Peter comes up in a taxi a moment later, so Willie takes Harper over to a closet where Barney subdues him. Willie finds half of a piece of paper identifying him to Cordell, putting it in Sandy's purse. Sandy tells Cordell she's Leslie Harper, and she presents her piece which matches Cordell's piece. Sandy says her employer is willing to pay Cordell a lot more than he's making now, and apparently gets an apartment next to Peter in his building. At 11 o'clock at night, they must have like a 24-hour rental office or something. Anyway, the next day, Harry learns about the death at the chess club from a syndicate man, who says they're concerned that Peter's doing other jobs on the side telling Harry to get his brother to keep a low profile for a while. Peter has flashbacks to the argument, sees visions of Dr. Adler lying dead. Harry comes up and expresses his concerns, including about Sandy and her offer, which seems to be getting them into hot water. Very hot-looking Sandy comes over to continue to push her offer, and Harry leaves in a huff, seeing police officer Barney arrive downstairs as he leaves. Sandy distracts Peter as only a female IMF agent can, avoiding Harry's warning call from downstairs. Barney questions the two of them about the murder. Sandy lies and says that Peter arrived earlier than he actually did, and Barney leaves satisfied with her answers. Peter is hopeful to spend more time with Sandy, but she leaves, with Harry accosting her in the hallway and telling her to stay away from his brother. Peter arrives for his next game with psychiatrist Jim, who tells him about a soldier patient of his who experienced killing and had visions of it ongoing, leading to more murders based on imagined episodes of anger, an argument that didn't actually happen, for example. Peter asks for a postponement of the game because of his agitated state, and Jim agrees. When Peter heads outside, he finds Barney waiting for him, and Harry sees Barney take Peter aside to go to headquarters. Harry gets in his car to whisk Peter away, but Willie runs into him with a service van, angrily confronting him about Harry being the cause of the accident while Barney says the magic words to Peter, putting a gun in his hand and firing it. Peter wakes up and sees that Barney appears to have been his next victim, victim, with Harry coming on the scene, distressed at the turn of events. Peter flees back to his apartment, finding Sandy lying on his couch. Harry arrives and confronts Peter, who says he blacked out and can't remember what happened. Sandy then says the magic words, and Jim knocks Harry out while Peter trances out again, and Harry's gun gets put back into Peter's hands. When he comes back to life, Sandy amazingly asks why he did it, and Peter is shocked at what's happened. 
Sandy stabs him with a knockout ring, and Cordell, Peter Cordell, that is, wakes up later finding himself in a prison ward with Dr. Jim. And Peter laments that he's all alone, has no idea what's happening to him. He asks Jim if he talked about anything while he was passed out. Jim tells him not to worry about that for now. He'll likely be able to plead insanity at trial. Jim leaves and hands the key to Cordell's room to an ominous-looking orderly who enters the room with a vicious smile, grabbing a pillow and attempting to smother Cordell, who tries to fight back, and the orderly puts the emergency bell in his hand so he can save himself. Next to arrive is somewhat friendlier-looking Willie, and Peter tells him about the other guard, but, well, he's in a psych ward, so Willie tells him to calm down and says he's heard about all the delusions before. Yeah, everybody's trying to kill you. Willie says Sandy has arrived to see him, so Peter calms down. Peter tells Sandy that it's clear from the orderly's actions that his employers don't trust him anymore, and his life is at risk. He tells Sandy to deliver a message to the employer right away. Get him released, or else he'll go to the cops with what he knows. He gives her a phone number to call and a code to use from an old chess game. Sandy makes a call and gets a response with a place to meet. Harry wakes up and is able to subdue the police officer watching him, making a call as well. A limo pulls up, inviting Sandy in, and the passenger asks her for the message. She asks the question about the chess move, and the passenger asks the driver for the answer. Harry's call comes in, warning him about, warning uh, driver Alex, about what's happened to Peter, and is sure that Sandy is behind it all. The driver, Alex, answers her question, but believes her to be a cop, telling the other man to keep her quiet. They drive off with the IMF following them into a tunnel, and police are already on the other side. The police take the man into custody, and Sandy drives off with the IMF. Mission accomplished. I'm going to give this episode a grade of a D-. minus. I'm actually making a spreadsheet with all of the episodes and the grades that I've given them so far. So with these episodes that are coming, I want to look back and I and, and I say, because I'm already thinking about the ranking that I would like to do, and saying, okay, so is this better than that one? And I'm kind of like trying to place them a little bit. This one I had originally slated for an F, for reasons that you will see. But I softened my tone on it a little bit. And I'll tell you exactly why. Starting with the good, the basics of this episode are fine. You've got the good teamwork, which you have in pretty much every episode. You have to, where there's only four agents, you know, to do the work. The screenplay is good, despite the not-so-great story, and we'll talk about that afterwards. But certainly, this one deserves a D-, minus solely on the basis of the performance and the presence of of Marilyn Mason, who plays Sandy in this one. I was very sorely tempted to actually put a bit of a higher grade, maybe even a D or a D plus, because she really is that good. I loved her in the right from the get-go, in the scene in the tavern where she says, I'm Leslie Harper. She's the right kind of actress for this show. She has the vibe a little bit of Barbara Bain. I know nobody can replace Barbara Bain as, you know, the MI female agent. I get that. But I can sort of feel the vibe from her. And I believe her as somebody who could step in and kind of fill that role. I can't put my finger on exactly why. But I think that she's a kind of actress who could play a whole bunch of different kind of roles, versatile roles, the way that Barbara Bain did. She also reminds me very much of Jessica Walter. If you remember her from back in the season four episode Orpheus, I really liked her. Peter Graves thought that she would have been a fantastic addition to the show. I completely agree. She had that same kind of vibe. And again, maybe it, maybe it's just you know her presence, the way she comes across. You can you can see that you know, you know she's she's got that kind. She really exudes that kind of sexiness, the whole femme fatale thing. I really really buy it with her. That said, that alone is not enough to overcome a whole bunch of other things. So let's move on to the bad. This episode is you know derivative of many episodes that have come before it. Plot-wise, it's sort of like the season five opener, The Killer. 
you know, the comparison begins and ends, uh, you know, at that level. You can't really compare the two episodes in terms of quality. This one also reminds me very, very much, I think it's a combination, I would say, of the episode from season six called Image, if you remember that one, that was with the Corsican brothers. And it was exactly the same kind of plot where, you know, the mark is put under hypnosis and the IMF is able to do whatever they like with him. And I have much more to say about that. It's also combined with the tactics that the IMF use in the recent episode called Hit, where they have a mark, an antagonist, a villain, who has information that they need. They need to find out somebody's identity. So what do they do? They take all of the Mark's support away from him, and they isolate him so he has nowhere else to go, nowhere to run, except to the person that the IMF is actually looking to uncover. I do not like Alex Cord as the villain. It's another one of those things that I really can't put my finger on. I think it has something to do with just the way, just, just his delivery and the way that he comes across. He doesn't come across with any formidability to me as a type of guy who would be a contract killer. Compare him to Robert Conrad from The Killer. That guy was a contract killer, right? This guy here... Uh, I'm I'm really not buying it. Interestingly, Alex Cord is the only actor who comes back in the revival series as a villain again. Now, that's a completely different episode, completely different plot. They're totally unrelated, except for the fact that it happens to be the same human being playing the villain in both episodes. And even in that one, again, I had a bit of a problem with it, but that's a discussion for when we move on to the revival series. I would have much more, I would have been much more comfortable buying Peter Breck, who plays Harry Cordell, as the villain. He exudes that kind of vibe for me. And that would have been a lot better, I think, in terms of a casting choice. I, I'm not sure exactly what the directors and producers were trying to go there with Alex Ford. It doesn't resonate with me. Other things that were bad. In terms of this story, oh, come on with this hyper-suggestibility crap, okay? I, 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 I've already talked all about it in the, in, uh, in the episode from Season 6, Image, where we have a few drops of a drug as a trigger, or, or not as a trigger, but as a method of putting somebody under. In that episode, it was a spiked cigarette, if you remember. But again, it's the same idea. That might have been even a little bit more believable because you're actually taking something into your lungs and it's getting into your bloodstream. It, it, it's still completely bogus, but at least it's a little bit more believable. Here, we're supposed to believe that a few drops of a drug ingested through the skin as Peter Cordell handles one of his chess pieces that he's about to play with is enough you know, to, to put him in this state where he can be put under hypnosis just by Jim looking at a lighter and talking to him a certain way. I, I, I just can't buy that. And as lame as the process was in that episode, Image, this is even worse. This episode, of course, also suffers from the big problem of any episode where they have this hypnosis or hypersuggestibility thing. If the IMF can convince Peter Cordell that he's committed three murders and now he has nowhere to run, so, you know, he has to enlist Sandy to, you know, go find his employer, why don't they just get him to tell them who his employer is? Why go through all of this song and dance, this whole dog and pony show, all of this stuff? Come on, if you can do that, you can do anything. You can get the guy to do anything you want, right? If he's under that level of hypnosis. I, it, it, it just absolutely does not make sense. Also kind of more to the point with that, moving ahead just a little bit, I have some other things that I want to say. 
I get the IMF's plan. In terms of a story, yes, it's a story. It's a cogent story in that, in that you know, the procession of events is logical. Makes sense. But I've mentioned before in, on many occasions where the IMF is able to tilt the playing field so much in their favor that it just becomes ridiculous. If you put anybody in a psych ward, or pretend or make them believe that they're in a psych ward. You can get them to do pretty much anything you want. I am glad that the IMF doesn't do this more often, because if they did, it would make pretty much any mission easy. As soon as you do that, you know, it's pretty much game over. It's really, really, really hard to get yourself out of a psych ward. Because, you know, psychiatric nurses and personnel and orderlies and all of the people there, they know all the tricks. They've heard it all before. You can't convince them that you're sane, okay? It just doesn't happen that way. It really ties into the whole thing where, certainly, Peter Cordell is a lame schmuck in every sense of the word. I would also put him in the unengaging category. Again, not that Alex Cord is a bad actor, he is not. But the character of Peter Cordell is just, again, as I already mentioned, he's just miscast as, as that particular character. He doesn't fit the mold of what he is supposed to be. Further to Peter Cordell being a lame schmuck, I almost feel sorry for the guy. You know, he is so overmatched by the IMF. And I think maybe this is more of the problem that I have with putting Alex Cord in as that character. Is, you know, he's got that kind of face and build. You know, he, he's not a really big guy or anything like that. And, and his face is such that you could actually feel sorry for this guy. You know, like, geez, what are you putting this guy through? Let up on him a little bit, you know? As I mentioned, Peter Breck as Harry would have been a better fit. You know, he's got, you know, just the look of his face and his build. You know, he looks more like a tougher guy that, you know, could actually handle maybe what the IMF would be throwing at Peter. But Peter just looks like he, you know, at, at some points he looks like he's just going to cry. And, and and that and that's really really tough in terms of you know establishing what I've, I've talked about a lot the line between the good guys and the bad guys if a bad guy is sympathetic in any way eh, you might want to rethink the way that you're kind of framing his characterization and your plot all of this stuff that I've talked about already that overarches you know the entire story so as cogent as it is as reasonable as the sequence of events are, you know, come on, we're, we're suspending our belief way too much in this particular case. Some specific notes. When Jim and Peter are ready to sit down to play their second game, Jim tells Peter that he is treating a patient with dementia precox. This guy who has visions of killing, doesn't remember what happened, but he feels like he gets himself angry and then suddenly bad things happen. I looked it up because I said to myself, wait a minute, this isn't a thing, is it? Or at least it's not a modern thing because I remembered something. I actually did a project about this. Dementia precox is what we now call schizophrenia. And it has been called that since 1908, 65 years before this episode aired. Schizophrenia does not necessarily, only very rarely, has anything to do with having visions or being violent or anything like that. That is a complete misconception. First of all, by using a, a, a term that shouldn't even be in Jim's vocabulary because it hasn't been used since several years before Jim Phelps and Peter Graves were born. So that's a problem. Other things that I found that were not good have to do with the whole thing about chess. I am not a great chess player, but I know the game and I can follow it. And I can look at a game and I can watch it unfold and, and, and I can see where, oh, wait a minute, that was a really, really good move. Or that was a really, really bad move. That was a mistake. That, that I can, that I can most certainly do. The game between Cordell and Jim, the, the, the game that they actually play, 
the opening was played so horribly. Just watching it, I winced. I'm like, if you played that way against a computer, you would just get absolutely slaughtered. And then, in the in, in, again, it, it's supposed to be because of the effect of the drug, but Cordell blunders so badly on the last move, missing a clear checkmate. It reminds me of the episode A Game of Chess from back in season two, which I also did not like for exactly one of the re there were lots of reasons, but one of the reasons was exactly this. You don't beat grandmasters in nine moves. Computers don't do that. They do beat them, you know, regularly, you know, over time, 40, 50 moves, whatever, but not like that. And grandmasters just simply do not miss clear checkmates, one move checkmates like that. Another thing that kind of bothered me at the chess club, when Jim and Peter are about to sit down and play their second game, there should be a crowd that gathers around them. After all, these are the champions of the club that are playing each other. People should be ready. People should be like, oh, gosh, let, let, let's go watch and that sort of thing. And that didn't happen. Now, obviously, you know, it turns out that they don't actually play. And, you know, we, the viewing audience, may understand that. But there should have been people there. The last thing... This is really, really nerdy, but I have to point it out. Yeah, I looked it up. There was indeed a world championship match, actually a series of matches, between Wilhelm Steinis and Mikhail Chigurin. I, I do know this because I've, I've studied some chess history. It did happen in 1892. There was not a game with 29 moves. Again, I looked it up. They had a match that consisted of 23 individual games, but there was not one like this that was described here where there was a winning move of 29, move 29, queen to bishop four. Sorry. Uh, I wish, you know, if, if the writers are going to do something like this, I get it. It's 1973. You know, we don't have Google or anything like that at this point, but there are lots of books with chess games in them. It would have been a really, really, really simple thing to look up. And as I've mentioned before, that sort of thing just tells me that there might have been a lack of attention to detail in certain other areas. I've already mentioned about, you know, the, the overarching thing with the hyper suggestibility in the whole story. I didn't really notice a lot that was lacking in terms of other detail, but I got to think that it was there based on little things like this. I don't want to make too much of a big, big deal out of it, but it just it just puts that that thought in my mind about geez, what else is there? What else did they miss? And what else were they uncaring about? I hate thinking that way, but I can't help it. Anyway, I think I'm going to leave it at that. You know, the the I could keep repeating the usual things that I do in other reviews, but I don't think that's really necessary here. I think there's enough said in this one. Thank you guys, as always, for watching this review video. Please give this review, review video a like. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and please leave your comments about this and other episodes. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time.